Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another distant show. I'm here at Bending Branch with Dr. Bob Young. Now, I've no reason why I haven't been here in 10 years. I've been doing this thing. They've been open 10. They've been open 10 years. I'm doing 10 years. How's that cool is that? Um, but I finally did it. I made promises I would come out. So we're out here uh, hanging out, and um, I got to do a little tour of the facility of the winery. I got to see some cool equipment. Uh, on the crush pad that I'm really excited to have uh, Dr. Bob talk about um, and um, we'll go from there. So Bob, why don't you kind of let people know who you are and kind of how'd you get into all this? All right. Well, first of all, thank you for being here. It's about time, Mark, that you made it out here. I mean, really. <laughs> right? exactly. Yeah. Top Texas winery and here you are. Um, so uh, how I got here? Well, I was always uh, very interested in wine, particularly big wines, big bold reds is kind of my, my favorite. And I was in the medical field as a physician for 35 years. I got interested in some of the medical research, actually on compounds that are in red wines that uh, potentially have, right. uh, you know, are yeah. ben beneficial. So that piqued my interest. And uh, then after I sold my practice, um, my daughter had already moved to Texas. So I, I moved out here from Atlanta, Georgia, and started looking for, for property to grow grapes and, and make, make wine. Okay. So we found this property and actually purchased it in February ten years ago. So hmm. so we've been out That's here for ten I years. The URL for thirteen thirty seven wine. <laughs> no joke. <laughs> meant, to be, meant to be. Meant to be. So our theme out here we call it as next world wines, and yes. we're not old world. We're not new world. We're we're pushing pushing the border. Okay. Uh, and what that means is that we're looking for uh, unique varietals that will do well here in Texas. So part of our research has been focused around that. And we're also looking to make big bowl reds in Texas. And that can be challenging because of the climate here. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of, you know, the science part that we bring to the table here on how it's all about extraction. You want to get all those good, luscious molecules of okay. various types out of the grape and into the wine. And so that's where, that's where the science part comes in. Okay. So that, that's a good little segue into uh, basically flash the taunt because that's one of the big things that you use that for, correct? Yes. Yes. Um, so before we get to what it does, why use that rather than the traditional just maceration sure. uh, of stuff? That's a great question. So as a generalization, if you, if you take red grapes and you ferment them traditionally, you extract roughly from 30 to 40 percent of the polyphenols, and these are the tannins hmm. and also the color compounds, the okay. two most important compounds in, in really good red wine, right? So um, that means there's 60% still left in, that's thrown away in the pumice. That's what's left over after you press wine. So if you're in a climate like we're in, where it's really hot and it's the, things grow fast and the, the physiologic maturity of the polyphenols is not equal to what it might be, let's say, in Napa Valley, as an example. Okay. Then you have to figure out if you want to make wines to compete with them or to compete with Bordeaux. Um, you have to figure out how to extract those compounds that are in the grape. So we focus a lot of our science and technology on, on how to improve extraction. Okay. And probably the, the best way to do that uh, and get the most out is to use flash detente. Um, the research that we've done here suggests that on average, it increases the extraction of tannins and color compounds by 100%. So you virtually double the extraction of what, what you would if you would just traditionally ferment that okay. red wine. 
Um, yeah, that doesn't translate into more volume. That's just more extraction into the... No volume. No, there. no. You actually get a little less volume because you lose a little bit in the process okay. uh, through evaporation right. and, and condensation. And so the way this whole thing works, and by the way, this is not a new technology. They've right. been using it in France and Spain and Italy for 20 plus years. Um, it's used in California. It's big name wineries, I won't name them, that, uh, that use it in California. Um, so this is a process where you use rapid heating. Mm -hmm. You heat the must, which is, you know, all, all the grapes and, and the seeds and, and the liquid part, you know, uh, together to 185 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's not quite boiling, but it's really hot. Um, and what that does is it weakens the cell walls of the skins. And so then you move that hot must into a vacuum chamber, and that rapidly cools it from 185 down to 90. And with the change in pressure and the weakened cell walls, then the cells burst open, and it releases all those wonderful polyphenols. Okay. That's how it works. All right. Um, so what... Using that, using that uh, process, um, besides getting that extraction, does that give you anything that you can do for the wines? Is it if you have any challenges with a with a vintage? Is it does it help you with other things other than just getting that extraction? Man, you've got a lot of great questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually uh, knew know a little bit about Flash Saint <laughs> okay. um, and so. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I yes. find this fascinating. So it, 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 it has a lot of uses. We we use the t got the technology to make you know, world-class, big, bold red wines, okay? Mm -hmm. But it has a lot of side benefits. So one of them is in uh, an off-season, let's say, uh, 2016 he here in Texas. So the rains were coming in uh, about two or three weeks before the expected harvest date. So what do you do? Do you pick early and, and your sugar levels are lower, your tannins are lower, and, and your flavor, you know, everything's lower? Or do you wait and risk it for maybe even lose the crop? because because of the heavy rains okay. so using this technology we can harvest early and um, still get very good results for example um, we had a we had a cabernet that came in that year and it came in uh, like at uh, 22 bricks and okay. for for your listeners uh, bricks is the percentage of sugar mm -hmm. and that which of course is turned into alcohol so Winemaker in general for Cabernet wants 24 or 25 bricks. Okay, so we take the 22 bricks cab, we run it through the flash detente process. It comes out at 24 to 24 and a half bricks because we lose some through through evaporation. Okay. Uh, then also, you know, the tannins weren't totally mature, but because of this enhanced doubling of the extraction, we're still in good shape with tannins. Um, and, and color compounds. Okay. Number three scenario is, okay, you mess up and you miss time your harvest and the rains hit and then, then a few days later you got a harvest and you've got, now you've got a little bit of rot in your fruit. That's, that's a problem. Yeah. Um, so one year that happened, we had about seven vineyards around the state bring their fruit in and we saved six of the seven bunches. Um, and what flash detente does for that is the heat, basically uh, it destroys the rot enzyme. So the whatever rot is already there, you know, is there, but nothing okay. else happens going right. forward. So that's, that's eliminated. It also eliminates bacteria uh, and unwanted yeast so basically, the the fruit comes out and and uh, it's um, ground zero. So you can you can put whatever whatever yeast you want want to to ferment okay. it. All right. So. And so if you had like some like a like a, a cooler vintage or whatever, and you had a little extra green that you didn't want, is that also something you can use flash detente for? Uh, maybe not necessarily here in Texas, but maybe well, elsewhere. Yes, even even here in Texas. So one of the side benefits of, mm -hmm. of this technology is um, the green flavors like the cooked green beans and asparagus, green bell pepper, those kind of things. Some people like them, but the majority of people don't. <laughs> you like a little bit? <laughs> a little bit. A little bit of bell pepper jalapeno. But not, yeah. not, not, no, no, no. Can't green beans, jalapeno? asparagus. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the pyrazine yeah. pepperish, yes. 
but I don't want it to be the dominant flavor. Yeah. So so this technology takes out the methoxy pyrazines. Okay. So it, it eliminates them. Now, if if you want to put them back in, you can. You can, yeah. <laughs> they, they come out and they condense out into water. The water is right. called flash water, mm -hmm. and it's usually pretty nasty. Tasting. I'm sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> so you can legally put it back in. Okay. I haven't heard of anybody that's done it yet. It's, Probably somebody has. Yeah. Not put a like, touch of green back in. Uh, at the symposium, they were talking about like uh, uh, doing a, having sweet spots with alcohol using reverse osmosis, or whatever, and you, you put the water back in to, yeah. to get your, so right. you probably don't want to do that with flash day taunt water. <laughs> probably, not, probably, right? probably not. Okay. <laughs> so, but you know, we were, we're doing some research out here too. I, uh, you've probably heard of uh, a variety, a variety that's native here called black Spanish. Yes. So it's got this foxy kind of meaty flavor to it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say, well, you know, if you'd eliminate that flavor, then this could make pretty good wine. So we're, we're actually uh, near the end of a research project with uh, Texas AgriLife uh, where we've taken black Spanish grapes, put them through the flash detente. Okay. Um, they're doing sensory studies and, and tasting studies and, and chemical analysis and all that. But in general, it's looking favorable. Okay. Uh, I, know, I know when one of the professors was out here and we were running, running the black Spanish through and he was tasting the, the flash water, he said, it's in there. Okay. It's in there. <laughs> that funk is in the water. So, so, is that something uh, so that's kind maybe, of exciting okay. for the future. So something you can maybe use with other uh, native uh, grapes, you know, to the United States, things like, you know, Norton and Katawa or whatever the other grapes are. Potentially, yes. Potentially, in fact, yeah. um, there are only about a dozen and to 15 of these machines in the U.S. Mm -hmm. We have the only one in Texas. Uh, Michigan just got one, and they got it basically to deal to deal with those okay. uh, types of, of hybrids. Uh, they're also testing one up in New York now uh, for similar reasons. Okay. So that's a, that's a fair possibility. All right. Uh, I mean, I'm fascinated with, with that process. You know, um, you, you talked actually with our group a while back at one of the places I worked at and kind of talked about it. And honestly, when you showed up and talked about that, if I looked it up on Google, it was actually hard to find anything on it. Now, like it's it, it that that actual process is like the first thing you see, and it's like it's all over. So it's easier now to find out information rather than to, before you had to like really had to know what the true name was. And I, I know you, had, Jennifer, had mentioned it was like flash of time. It's called something else. Um, uh, uh, biothermal, 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 yeah. biothermal cooling. Yeah, yeah, biothermal cooling. Yeah, BTC. Yeah, if you had looked up that way, it'd be easier to find. But yeah. um, now yeah. it's easy to find yeah. under the flash detente. So I, actually, there's a whole new term that's that's come up. Um, that's because of the flash, and it's called airwar. Okay. Everybody knows terroir, terroir right? Yeah. So airwar is you know what gets into the grape through the air. Okay. And the reason this came up is that. Um, with various different vineyards that got flash detente used, they found that if you had a vineyard next to a highway with all these diesel trucks going by all okay. the time, you run it through the flash, the grapes from that vineyard, and you actually taste the petroleum in, in, in the, water, in the water that comes out. Wow. So that could be also something like in Australia, if you're near eucalyptus, Trees sometimes eucalypt gets into the yep. into the in there or smoke taint maybe yeah in smoke fact uh, yeah. the units out in California back during the fire fire season in, yeah. in Napa they were running twenty four seven yeah they don't extract at all but they do help they do help in, okay. in getting smoke smoke yeah. taint out where yes. I was somewhere that oh I was uh, uh oh we had uh, it, it, the um, Psalms under fire competition I went to over this this past weekend. We had some we had some uh, South African wines during a VIP tasting. One of them was Pinotage, um, and uh, it wasn't the Pinotage. It was another red in there. And I don't remember what it was off the top of my head, but it was smoky. And I was like, oh, I like this one. It's smoky. And they're like, well, we had a lot of fires that day. I'm like, well, there you go. <laughs> so it was technically smoke taint, yeah. but I kind of liked it. But Barbecue it was, wine. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and it wasn't like terrible smoke. It was just like it was like drinking a Syrah. Like from Northern Road, it was like, oh, it's kind of smoky. Um, so then you also have another uh, technique that you've actually been using a little bit longer, uh, cryo maceration. Cryo maceration. Yeah. Yes. So, what, so what, that what's, was what's so cool about that. Um, no pun intended. I didn't really mean that. <laughs> I just as soon as I said, it, I was like, so what? Yeah. 
What, what, what's good about that? Yeah. So, uh, this process is totally different from flash, you right. know, which uses heat and rapid cooling. This uses, you know, extreme, um, low temperatures. So what we do is, uh, we destem the grapes and we put them in, in containers and we take them to a commercial freezer. We freeze it down to about zero degrees Fahrenheit and we leave it frozen for several, several weeks. And okay. we've experimented with different, different terms of aging, but, but the physiology here of what happens is that the ice crystals that form, they break open the cell walls okay. of the skins and then the vacuoles inside. And so that causes more extraction to come out. So we keep it frozen, we bring it, bring it back at a later date to the winery. It takes, these are half ton size grape ice cubes. Okay. <laughs> so it takes about a week for them to thaw out, but then wow. we ferment them exactly the same way. We use the same, same material, same yeast and uh, et cetera. Okay. And from the very first wine we made here at Bending Branch, we did side by side comparisons of, of the frozen technology versus the standard technology. And so the results vary somewhat, but in general, you get about 50% more extraction okay. of tannins and, and color. Whereas with the flash, you double it, you get a hundred percent more. The kind of neat thing about the cryo is that you, you also get, um, more of the natural flavors out using that process as okay. well. So we, we use that on some fruit and some on others. Um, it tends to work really nicely in particular with some of the um, kind of not as bold uh, reds like let's say Mouvedre is an example. It works okay. really, really good with Mouvedre. It works nicely with Malbec okay. too. Uh, we've done it with Tanat. In fact, the very first wine that we use cryo on was our estate Tanat uh, picked in 2011. And that wine won the award for the top Texas wine at the Houston International Rodeo Winery Competition okay. in 2014. And a magnum of it was auctioned off for $100,000 nice. for a charity. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. So, so okay, we're on to something, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so with these techniques and, and traditional methods, do you mix and match these things? Or do you have like any like 100% cryo, 100% flash or... Yes, we have 100%, and we're also starting to experiment with, with different combinations. Okay. Um, and um, so, so we have examples of each. We're, you know, we haven't been at this too long yet, so we haven't found the, you know, the magic spot for, for right. everything yet. But uh, every year we're trying new things. And, and, uh, but sometimes 100%, like we have a Cabernet right now that's out, uh, made from Newsom Vineyards. Uh, up in the high plains okay. and it was 100 percent flash and it had so much structure to it that we used a hundred percent new american oak on it and you can barely tell that it has oak in this wine oh, I, mean, I mean it's just such a big a big well-structured cabernet that's gonna gonna age um, a long long time okay. and last week it just won best of class cabernet at the texas international wine very competition nice. in, in Austin. Okay. So we're real proud of that one. All right. Um, so uh, uh, we touched on a couple things with oak. Um, we'll do that because we'll talk about that since it's more wine, wine related thing. Then we'll talk about some vineyard stuff. Um, so you have a mixture of oak. Um, you, uh, when we're doing, I was doing the tour, we had, uh, we talked about, uh, well, Jennifer and I talked about, um, uh, mixed use of oak as far as new and and and, and neutral. Um, can you talk about what your philosophy is on, on oak? Sure, it, it it all uh, depends on the wine. Okay. Um, so if you're if you're going for the really big wines like the Tanat and the Cabs and the, and the Malbecs, uh, the Petit Syrahs, then we use a lot more new new oak on those. Okay. If you're if you're looking more at uh, uh, again example Mouvedre. Uh, less uh we make we make a unique varietal called Souchal. it's a portuguese varietal okay uh, i don't know if you've had it had I it before i think I've, i think i've 
heard of it. I, well, I'd have to you see should it. have some before you I, leave I've, today. I've, <laughs> I'd have to see it on paper to know if I've ever even heard of the grape. Yeah. Now, now I'm intrigued. But it, but it, but it has all, it's a Tentorie grape, and okay. so it has it has almost black pulp. <laughs> Thank you for pronouncing because I never pronounced that word right. <laughs> so, real quick, that's, that's a grape that has red juice instead of clear juice. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. And in fact, the one, the one that we grew here on the estate had black pulp. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was it was amazing. Um, so that one, it has such a unique, complex fruit flavor that we don't put much oak on it. We just don't want to disturb all that. Okay. All that beautiful flavor. And uh, you, if you're using new oak, you're using using American for the most part. But you have some French occasionally here and there. Yeah, more more American than anything else. Um, it it tends to work really well with Tanat and and of course, you know. For years in, in Napa, it's worked really, really well for, okay. for Cabernet. Yeah. Um, with uh, with Tempranillo, which is kind of, uh, you know, a little notch down on the on the color and, and structure side of things, um, we use we use very fine, tight grade American oak. Mm -hmm. And recently, we started, you know, using a little bit of French in, in that combination right. too. So a little bit of a mixture of the two. Yeah. Um, okay, um, I, I kind of I made a made a comment in the winery. It was like it was anti Rioja, but actually Rioja producers are now using more French oak than they used to. But the traditional was all American, but there was a lot of reasons why not, which we won't go into. Um, uh, and so talking about vineyards, so you, you you mentioned quite a few times about estate about estate wines. Um, so you've got some vineyards on site, uh, and you had planted them like right like from the beginning yes i think um three months after we bought the property we put the first first grapes in the ground okay and the very first grape on this property was tanat okay and uh, it is our signature varietal uh, um, i'm a firm believer it's one of the best varietals in the world and, and, I've and been, it just I've grows been, yeah. <laughs> it just grows like yeah. crazy here uh, people who who now grow it. I mean, we we were really one of the pioneers of Tanat in, in the state of Texas, and we found out it out. We planted 16 varieties here, mm -hmm. and it outgrew everything by hands and fist. It's got a really tough leaf. It almost reminds you a little bit of a tobacco leaf. Okay. It's so it's so tough. Um, it's very thick skin fruit, and um, um, it just um, it just grows. Is it pretty disease resistant? Or? Generally, I mean, it it won't like anything else. It's Vitis vinifera, which is the European grape varieties. For for your listeners are not familiar with that term, uh, Pierce's disease will kill any of them. Okay. There's there's none of none of the those vines that will survive right. Pierce's disease, which is endemic to South Texas. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then things like uh, powdery mildew, powdery mildew. Downy mildew, that yeah. type of stuff. Is it, yeah, it holds resistant? up pretty well. It holds okay. up pretty well. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, um, cool. And then, uh, and then you also got some partners out in High Plains. Yeah. So what we've with. done, we've done some cooperative agreements. Um, uh, I mean, the growers in this state are, are so wonderful and, and working together. So uh, if we had a variety that we wanted to plant, and some examples are Tanat, Picpoul Blanc, Souchal, Malbec. Um, uh, I think those are the primary ones. Uh, we partnered with several people. We buy we buy the vines, they plant them, and they manage them. We work closely, you know, and uh, make suggestions on the management of the vines right. if we have, you know, need to do that. Um, so for our, our biggest partner has been Neil Newsom at Newsom Vineyards. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we have about five or six acres up up there now uh, of Tanat and Petit Sera and, and, uh, and a little bit of Alicante Boucher. Okay. Um, and um, Neil just does a wonderful job growing up there. His, right. his products are, are wonderful, and uh, we love, love working with his grapes. Yeah. So we also have a partnership with, um, you know, Talent Vineyards in, uh, in Mason, Mason mm -hmm. County. Uh, it's not too far from here, right? Just about an hour north of yeah. here, something like okay. that. Uh, Andy Timmons. Uh, Another grape that we're excited about is called Sagrantino mm -hmm. from uh, Montefalco and Umbria. Yeah, and uh, I like these big bold varieties. Uh, you know, if you if you look at the varieties that have the most tannins in them, Tanat's number one and Sagrantino is number two. So uh, we're going to be releasing our first Sagrantino here 
um, in a few months. Yeah, I, I've I've had another winery, Sagrantino, uh, actually a few weeks ago at the symposium, and it was pretty good. Oh. It was really good. Okay. Um, props to them. Um, and and I and they they I've had wine I've had that varietal from them in the past uh, in the visit to them. So, but this was a really good one. Um, and uh, I've had the, the Italian versions, and they're they're pretty they're pretty bold i mean they're pretty tannic and yeah your face off type of thing yeah um well one of the things that, um, that we do is we love the tannins because they give it the structure and they help hold the flavor in and the ageability and all that but also we try to get those soft tannins because mm -hmm. those those are the ones that are silky and smooth that you love right love to drink right if, yeah. it, if it gets too grippy here yeah you know and uh you don't want it the, the the interview before you um, where I was at we were we was all off camera we were we were doing some tanat with him and um, uh, he was you know his his philosophy was try to I mean you want the tannins in there but you're trying to make it a little bit more approachable early um, oh absolutely you know because instead of like having to wait ten years to drink it you know which like every every Italian Sagrantino and, and you know or Barolo or anything like that it's just you, you, it has to sit for a while so. Um, and then, uh, well, I, we probably should get into some wine because it's been sitting here. <laughs> so uh, All right. we've got we've I'm got a Malbec and a Tanat, right? So uh, I'll go with the one that's right here first. Let's say no. Let's do that next. <laughs> that's that's actually the one. We'll that's in start, the glass. We'll start. We'll start. Oh, this one in the glass. All right. So yeah. um, so we've got the, the, the State Vineyards Tanat. Uh, this is the thirteen. Yeah, two thousand thirteen. And you notice a little CM on the label. CM. That might stand for cryo maceration. Ah, very nice. Okay, so you're like basically transparent on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean we, we have, like for do, our do customers. Do you have FDs on these two for flash detente? No. <laughs> uh, we actually put FL oh, okay. on them for flash. Oh, flash. Okay. Um, but we probably should have used your idea of, of FD on it <laughs> instead. <laughs> Well, you know, so I'll give you that one for free. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I just, I mean, I've had where this the estate, probably the estate's probably the one I've had the most over the years. Um, this is by far like the, the wine that I've had from Benning Branch and not that I've ever had any wines that were bad, um, but the ones I, I, I gravitate towards whenever I see a tasting and like, we have that, you know, and I think that's, I think a lot of people are, are that way with the Tanat for you. This, it's, you know, you're kind of, you say your signature, your signature wine. So to me, this, um, this one is um, a little bit of old world and new world kind of blended together. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it doesn't fit into either one of those categories in, for my taste. Um, I, I absolutely love this wine. It's a wonderful wine for uh, for food. Tons of black fruit and yes, I don't typically like look at back labels, but as I'm saying, tons of black fruit in my head. It says black cherry, like right there, which I'm like, well, yeah, it's there too. Um, and there is a I think the word riches on there too. There is a richness to it. Um, there's, but but the 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 fruit is there, but it's not like necessarily a new world fruit bomb. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, you get also, I got like a little bit of a caramel out of it um, when I was, when I first tasted it um, and vanilla and all, all the, all the good, all the good oak stuff that you can yeah. get. This but one, this one was about 50% new American yeah. oak. And it's not over the top either. Yeah. You know, it's just not, this is not a, a, a my, my, uh, my, uh, I don't want to say predecessor, but the guy who made video wine podcast famous Gary uh this is not an oak monster as he used to call these things um and uh he's getting back into wine apparently uh <laughs> no competition Gary because you're not doing videos anymore um but uh, well he's not he, he's actually he's actually producing a wine and he put a video out that he's able to ship to Texas so I was like you can send me some <laughs> <laughs> anyway um no this is really nice I mean the the, the, the black fruits there uh, it's got a richness to it. It's got a silkiness to it. It's got a smoothness to it. Um, and it's got just enough of the oak characteristics 
that it, 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 it smooths everything out. It's not like it's it's not it's it's in balance basically. It's not an out. It's very it's a very balance. very uh, silky yeah. elegant elegant line. And one one of the things I failed to mention when we were talking about cryo maceration is that um, it's one of those processes that makes the tannin silkier. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I think it it really really helped this this wine out. Okay, and I don't really, like I said, I don't look at back labels a whole lot. I will, depending on things. And, and usually when I'm tasting your wines, I'm usually, at a, I'm usually at a tasting, so I never really see the back label. But just as a glance, and I'm not sure if this is every back label, but I appreciate that you put some of the geeky stuff on there. You know, where you got the elevation, you've got, which is kind of cool. you got your bricks, you got your pH, um, you got your fermentation stuff i mean everything i mean this is this is the stuff that people like me um not necessarily a song but like a wine aficionado that kind of knows these things i think it's great that you have that on there because it helps give you an idea of what the wine went through you know yeah i've always appreciated that from other wineries um, that put that information on the label mm -hmm. because as a winemaker um you know it kind of fits together you know right with uh with what the end product is yeah instead you know you don't just have the the, the description, you know, it's not just the marketing fluff and, you know, that, that wineries put on the back label. You've got your scientific, you've got your, you've got your technical stuff to kind of back up what you, what, what the, uh, the description says. Um, so I appreciate that. It's very nice. So as you were talking about, you know, the pH and the bricks coming on. Um, mm -hmm. So this, for us winemakers, uh, a pH of 3.6 is a sweet spot. To be yeah, at. it's like right there. Yeah, and that's, so that's uh, that's another thing about Tanat is, is that it tends to come in with better better numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and does it retain 20, its, it retains its acid or its yes, pH better yes. with, with the climate? Yes. Um, 23 bricks, bricks is real close too. I mean, yeah. so it doesn't require much. This isn't much. really a, a high alcohol, is it? Is this like in the 13 and a half, 13 and a half, 14, 13, 8? So, I mean, especially considering that you can get high bricks in Texas. I mean, this is only 23. You can get high bricks in Texas. You know, that it's, it's nice to not have. This Depends on the year and the weather. Yeah, <laughs> you can, but that's not, it's not, it's not a guarantee. Um, you know, the lower alcohol wines, and I, I hear it, they're starting to trend that in California and not have these 15 and a half, yeah. 16% technically dessert wines, you know, cabs coming out. Um, the Having that restrained style really, I think, uh, it's easier to drink. It's more pleasant to drink. Um, and I think you can really get the flavors better. It's not just, wow, I can really taste the alcohol. And that's, you know, again, you want something in balance, right? Absolutely. Balance is critical. Very nice. Um, well, I think we should. Uh, what? Sh should we just chug these? <laughs> <laughs> uh, go, go for I it. Mean, go for it. I'm, you I know. mean, I mean, Dad can drive home if, if, uh, <laughs> if need be, and this is not that much, really, you know. But thank you so much, Jennifer. It's my friend Jennifer, <laughs> <laughs> who I've known for a very long time. Um, so let, we'll try this. Uh, we got the mall back here. So this is uh, the 16. Now this is out of Newsom, right? Yes. Okay. And um, you've been working with them for how long? Uh, let's see. 2011, I think was was it 10? 10. Okay. 10. Um, um, he was he was the first um, uh, vineyard really that we were able to uh, get into. And when we started out, it was very, very difficult to get fruit in Texas at that time because um, everybody had contracts. The, mostly the bigger wineries had contracts and all mm -hmm. the fruit was gone. So it was it was hard for young wineries if they didn't, uh, if they hadn't been planting grapes for years yeah. uh, to get fruit, so. Well, even some of the big wineries still were not getting all their stuff from Texas. You know, I, I know one of the big ones has converted 100% to Texas. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure about the other one, um, but, uh, and, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily. It's just, you know, a lot of times it's the economics of things. And I know, especially with young wineries, they, if they're trying to have a state fruit, 
they got to wait three, four, five years to really oh, get anything yeah. usable. So if you want to pay the bills, <laughs> unless you've you got make millions wine. of dollars, you got to make the wine somehow. Exactly. You know, whether it's you know you're able to get you know stuff from California or elsewhere, um, and even even if, even you know like in the case of you, you have a state fruit and you buy fruit from elsewhere and that from Texas, and that's not unheard of anywhere else in the world. You know, it's not, you know, sometimes people like try to talk about, well, all of our stuff, 100% of state, that's wonderful. You have complete control over it, but it doesn't mean you can't give guidelines to your growers that, you know, this set of, this, this plot of, of the vineyard, we like to have that farm a certain way, or we're going to pick it at this point. Right. I mean, what right. do you think they do in Burgundy? <laughs> so, I mean, it's all, almost all negotiant type of stuff. So, um, that, that's kind of my soapbox. Like a state isn't always better. It's just different. It can be better in certain ways, but you know, if you have a grower, then you have a great partnership with them. Yeah, you're going to get great fruit. Well, you know, the uh, skill set for being a great grower and for being a great winemaker are totally 100 percent different from one another. Yeah, and you need got to know totally different things. You have to have a different approach to things, mm -hmm. and so actually, in many ways. It takes, you know, an incredibly unique person to be at the top of their game in both of those things at the same right. time. So in many ways, it's probably easier to work with great growers and, and do your best job possible in making the wine. Right. Exactly. The Malbec is one of my favorite varietals. I have several, but this is one of them. And... There's not enough grown in this state yet. I think it, I think it's been a little bit over overlooked. Yeah. Neil Newsom grows some some great fruit, um, and um, I, I love this wine. We we put um, French oak on this one. Mm hmm There's like a lot going on in this. I mean, it's more on the palate for me than the nose. Um, there's where do I start? Tons of black fruit. Um, really a, a lot of black fruit, black, blackberry. Um, there's also like a, 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 a slight creaminess, vanilla. There is like a touch of like, touch of smoke. It's more like, like the, the spent embers of, of, you know, a campfire. Um, but it's not like just overwhelming smoke. Um, it's lots, almost, lots of spice actually, in there too. It's almost like, yeah, spice, it's almost like a smoked sausage, honestly. Really? Okay. Um, so well, or, I like or smoked brisket, sausage, so or like that's a brisket, good. Yeah, like a, oh, that's perfect. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, this is like, yeah, it's pretty fantastic. <laughs> um, you know, and, and again, these are things that like, I, that, that are for me are check boxes that I like in a wine, you know, um, not everybody likes this stuff. Just like, you know, I like a touch of bell pepper, um, in, in my Cabernet Franc or Sauvignon, um, or we'll put Carmenere. a little bit of that flash water yeah. back in just or, for you. Or that Carmenere from Chile. You know, again, it doesn't have to be the overwhelming thing, just like a Cab Franc from Loire. It doesn't need to be the driving force of it. But if it's in there, then I'm like, okay, it's, to me, varietally correct. Um, but, you know, just and same with Sauvignon Blancs. You know, if, it's, if, if, if I got the bell pepper in or the jalapeno in or the Hawaiian pizza type of thing, then, then I love that. But some people hate that stuff. So, you know, just because yeah. I like it doesn't mean it's the right way to drink wine or the right, the right combination. So, so this is an example of fruit that came in with almost perfect numbers. Okay. Had a pH of 3.5. Mm-hmm. Um, it had bricks of 20, 23.5. Okay. And so, you know, we just, we just ferment this. We you know, do the cryo on it that brings out more more of this flavor, the flavor, more complex flavor profile mm -hmm. that you were explaining. Right. Um, and you don't have to do all these additions, which you know, some years we have to do here in Texas because because it's of the weather. It's reality, right? Especially maybe like a maybe do some acid I mean, adjustments and. I some mean, other people talk about making natural wine, but if you if you get a wine that comes in with a with a pH of four point three, um, it's gonna be pretty flabby. It's going to be totally flabby. Yeah. So if you don't if you don't do something to it, it's going to be you're not going a to terrible wine. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, and I've I've mentioned this a few times, especially so I've, I've done you know earlier today I did an interview, and then at the wine symposium I did interviews with um, Wedding Oak and with Fall Creek, and you know we were we were being you know straight up, in, especially in a place like Texas, and, and this is not the only place in the world. Tons of people have adjustments, and some things are big adjustments some things are small adjustments um 
It's not doesn't make the wine any worse or better, um, you know. But there are things that you can do to improve the wine um, without like adding like certain additives to it. Um, but like if you're gonna do like acid adjustments, if you do alcohol adjustments, if you're gonna do some other um, or, or depending on your your oak regimen, you know, if you're gonna do 100% new, okay. If you're not gonna if you dial it back, I mean, to me that's it's an adjustment also. Especially if you, sure, especially if it's year to year. I mean, it's, it's just like. A formula where I'm going to do 100% new French oak every single year on my cab. Well, okay, fine. But um, if you're paying attention to what you've got going on, maybe that wine that year doesn't need as much oak, you know, or doesn't need as much of whatever else you're going to do. Absolutely. And uh, it's all about what the fruit, what is the fruit like when it comes in? How does it taste? Flavor profile? Um, Has it reached its total maturity or not? Right. What's the acid? What's the sugar? What's the pH? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, all those things are important. Exactly. And, and you, you know, make adjustments accordingly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think, I think we kind of covered a lot of stuff. Is there anything that maybe we didn't talk about that we probably should talk about or, um, um, I'm going to well, have another sip of this one. Let's about talk that. about... <laughs> How about this? How, um, so, what, what's your production? Uh, about, uh, we're we're at about know? we're at about ten thousand case production okay. right now. And is it mostly our, Texas? Um, yeah, it's mostly Texas. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about is we do also own a California winery. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, it's in the Sierra foothills. It's okay, a, it's a small boutique winery. It's called Ursa. All right. Uh, you know, like the constellation, the yeah, bear, the and the bear, big yeah. Big Dipper, and and all that, and um, you have the California flag on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the um, the Berkeley Bears now they they sell okay. our wine at the Berkeley Bears football games. Oh, very nice, <laughs> which okay. is kind of cool. Uh, so we we make a line of wines out there, and we're going to start um, importing those in a serious way soon in, okay. in, into Texas. And cool. uh, one of the members of our winemaking team, Greg Stokes, that you met earlier today. Yes. Uh, he makes wine out there along with his his wife. Uh, okay. And we got teamed up early on. He was our consultant when we first started. Um, and I was doing an interview with him on the telephone. And he, he said, well, I made this Tanat. I said, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> so he made the first varietal Tanat in California back in really? t- 2001. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So he and knows a little bit about it. He knows a lot about Tanat, and his wife has a Basque heritage. Okay. Her, her part of her, her family came from, you know, the Basque region of, of France. Okay. And one of the coolest wines we make at Ursa is called the Basque Blend. All right. And um, maybe you'll get to try it before you, you leave. But, so that's kind yeah, of that'd be cool, yeah. uh, a little known fact about the Bending Branch family of wines. I didn't know that at all. <laughs> I didn't know that. I'm not looking at you, Jeff. Look at the camera. <laughs> so, and we make a lot of different things there. We make, uh, we do barrel aged uh, Chardonnay. We do barrel aged um, uh, and fermented Viognier. We, we do talked about a double barrel. Barbera. Yes. We do Barbera out there. Okay. Um, I won't mention. But, but the... let's come back. Let's come back to Bending Branch yeah. and a double barrel. So yeah. All right. So my. Let's talk about that. So first of all, I'm not going to mention the wine that I've had that has this barrel aging in something that's other than like a wine barrel. I didn't really care for it, and most of the most of these styles of wines, I I don't hear good things. At least at least on the wine nerd side, I, don't uh-huh. I mean the regular consumer seems to love it. Um, so so let's, let's talk about why why you're doing that, and I think we're going to taste that a little bit later off camera not that we can't taste it on camera but we'll taste it off camera yep. just because we want to try it so sure. your philosophy of why you're doing well, that okay well it all goes back to um heritage of of where my wife and i grew up we grew up in central kentucky mm-hmm. in the bluegrass area um 60 miles south of bourbon county where it all started and you know 20 miles away from my house four roses distillery um, okay Another 60 miles away, you know, Buffalo Trace. And mm-hmm. we love the Kentucky Derby. And if you grew up in Kentucky, the biggest parties of the year were the Derby parties, right? right? Yeah. And so when we came out here, we wanted to have Derby parties. And so what do you drink at a Derby party? A mint julep. Mm-hmm. What's a mint julep made from? Bourbon. Bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
you can't have bourbon uh, at a winery. It's against the law. So how in the world do we make mint juleps if we can't have bourbon out here? So I came up with this harebrained idea. Uh, well, let's get some bourbon barrels and let's age our peak pool blanc in it. Okay. And then we can make mint juleps out of it. So we started out doing that eight years ago, I guess, something like that. And um, people just loved it. We call it single barrel blanc. So it's a white wine. It's one, and not many people make white wines aged in bourbon barrels. Right, and I've only known red ones, yeah. And you can't age it very long. Um, okay. When we did it the first time, we tasted, tasted that barrel every day. On the 11th day, it was awesome. Okay. It, was, it was golden. And so we pulled it out and uh, we serve it at the Derby and then we bottle it and, and we call it single barrel blanc. Okay. Um, so more recently, I so, said, well, it worked really good. Why don't we try it with our signature varietal, Tanat? So we took Tanat from three different Texas vineyards. Uh, we put it in four, four uh, bourbon barrels um, that had just been dumped after aging for 12 years. Okay. And um, we aged it for four months extra. It had already been aging in, mm -hmm. in, in other barrels for two years. And I went down to Total Wine, and I bought every bourbon aged red that I could find. And I thought ours just blew them out of the water. Um, the Robin, uh, Robert Mondavi had a nice one. I like that one. But, okay. but most of the others I tasted, they had... They had a lot of residual sugar, and they were mm -hmm. yes, they were not. That's usually the complaint is is that they had. So it's that. been it's been a huge seller at our place. Um, we're down to twenty nine cases after having it for sale for maybe I don't know um, two or three months. Okay, and um, we're pulling it out of competitions because it's all gone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but a week ago today, we had two international wine judges from the Czech Republic come okay. out here and go through our wines. They weren't bourbon drinkers. The wine they liked the best was our double barrel Tanat. That's what we call it. Oh, nice. Double barrel Tanat. So Nice. All right. So, and, and so it kind of goes back to the Kentucky yeah. tradition. And, and to me, I think there, there should be, this should be something good because barrels, whether they're wine barrels or bourbon barrels or sherry barrels, have been cross-used between least... Um, Distillates and wine for quite a while. Um, you know, the, you know, scotches. You know, been known to using sherry barrels for a long time. So, I, I think in theory it should work. Yeah. And then I, I'm also seeing all the commercials for like you know beer aged in you know wine barrels or bourbon. Well, not wine barrels, but bourbon barrels and all that. I haven't had any of those beers yet, but you know, and these are some pretty big wine breweries are doing it. So I would hope that yep. it's actually decent. But you never well, know. our friends out at Vista Brewing, they're they're getting our barrels and okay. they're making beer in it. Yeah. And, uh, so, I mean, in theory, this should be good. It should be just another flavor to add in. Just another, just exactly. Another thing for your palate, for the for the palate, not this palate, but the, you know your 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 painting palate. Um, and it should be good. It's just a matter of like if you have like a ton of residual sugar in your wine. So you get <laughs> you know in these wines, then you get a little more caramel. You get a little more vanilla. Yeah. And and maybe a little bit more char taste to it, right? Uh, yeah. Because they they char those char those barrels pretty right, good. Right. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm interested in trying some of that stuff a little bit later. So all all of these things we've talked about are the special grapes, uh, the special technology, mm -hmm. you know, the in innovative um, ways of, of making wine and using different types of barrels and things. That always all goes together and makes up Bending Branch uh, and our philosophy of next world wine. Yes, absolutely. Well, Bob, uh, I really appreciate you sitting down with me for a while, uh, spend some time with me to kind of go over the, the winery and the wines. Um, I've always liked the, the wines here from Bending Branch. I'm really happy I've been able to come out here and actually uh, check the place out. Um, now I have to come out here a little more often, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and, um, yeah, I think, I think we're going to wrap this up. I want to shake your hand. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I appreciate very much right. you being here. Let's go have some bourbon barrel wine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. All right, folks, that's going to do it for right now. Click the links above to friend me up. Um, click the links below to learn more about Bending Branch and Ursa. Um, and then uh, 
Remember, I have a referral code for Underground Seller. I do buy wine online. Um, so if you use that referral code 1337 wine, they give me a credit. That's about all that happens. Uh, so I can buy more wine from them. I don't get like actual money. But you know, hey, whatever a little bit helps. Um, and uh, we'll see everyone again next time.